This is a production of Cornell University. Um, thank you, Griff. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Hope everyone can hear me all right. I think I hear the microphone working. Um, I'm very happy to be here. As Griff mentioned, my name is Hannah. I'm a PhD candidate in the section of horticulture. Um, I am excited to share some of my thoughts and results from research focusing on how we as a vegetable breeding program can deploy some consumer driven strategies in the development of leafy brassica uh, varieties. Um, and I still have quite a bit of, I have still several months before I defend and quite a bit of synthesis to do before this story kind of comes full circle. Uh, but regardless, I hope that today creates a nice opportunity for some discussion and feedback on some of these strategies we've been employing. As Griff mentioned, we are a diversified vegetable breeding program. Uh, we work on many different crops. We focus on those coal crops like broccoli and cabbage, cauliflower, um, but we also venture into snap beans and dry beans, which is how I met Griff. Uh, we work on small fruited tomatoes, which we've had some recent releases of. Um, but really our program as of recently is characterized by kind of a shift uh, to selecting for quality traits and selecting for kind of consumer forward traits. So traits that are important to the appearance like shape and color, um, but also important to quality like flavor, texture, things like that. Um, our recent focus uh, has really been on breeding different leafy brassica types. So by that I mean kales and collards um, and exploring diversity in those leafy brassicas. And um, despite my parents' skepticism that I should work on kale when I started. Uh, I was intrigued by Griff's diversity and his program, and I wanted to see what I could contribute to the development of le these leafy brassica types. Uh, just to context contextual taxonomically contextualize kale and collard, uh, these leafy brassicas fall within a large plant family known as Brassicaceae. There's a huge plant family with lots of different diversity. A lot of the important horticulture and horticulturally relevant, agronomically relevant crops um, actually come from a single genus within this plant within this plant family, the Brassica genus. Um, and I won't go into too much detail here other than to say that this uh, Brassica, our, our program focus, focuses on just one of the species in this larger plant family, the Brassica oleracea. Um, and this Brassica oleracea is characterized by a diversity of morphotypes um, like broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower, all of which can be crossed and combined to create new diversity. Um, so it's a lot of fun to work with from a breeding perspective. However, breeding these leafy brassica types, um, you're dealing often with biennial types where it takes one year to go from seed to seed. And breeding these leafy brassica types can be a uh, slow and intensive process. Griff said I should just make this say it is a slow and intensive process, but it depends on your attitude, I guess. Um, but um, needless to say, this time of year when the greenhouse making crosses, we're hoping by the summer we can plant it out in the field so come September, we can make selections, evaluations, dig those up so we can vernalize them, all to bring them back out into the greenhouses next December, January, and start making crosses again. So it gets to be a tight schedule uh, when we're breeding leafy brassicas when we only get seed once a year. But I was not really deterred by this uh, when I arrived because in going to Griff's field, I saw that he had already started collecting um, a diverse germplasm base. And really I walked into a pretty wonderful breeder's palette when we're thinking about breeding for consumer quality and consumer forward traits. When I, before I started, Griff was already working with uh, collaborators to evaluate collars in the Southeast US. Um, he was, breeding broccoli and improving broccoli for the East Coast. He had projects to improve um, pigmentation in brassicas for the natural color industry. And then 2014 hit and a kale craze came. And so we started incorporating uh, different leaf shapes and leaf types from more of the kale uh, germplasms as well. So I walked into a breeder's palette of different shapes and sizes and colors that was just visually very fun. And what you can see here is on the right is actually a uh, PCA of um, commercially available leafy brassica varieties and materials from our program characterized by uh, GBS markers. 
And I don't want to go into too much detail, but basically these light colors and yellow, orange, and red represent either wild progenitors or commercial hybrids or open pollinated varieties available commercially. And you can contrast that diversity with diversity from our program, which are in gray and purple. And um, these represent just a small subset from our program and just a small subset from what's commercially available, but they essentially demonstrate that our program has genetic material that could diversify the Brassica oleracea landscape and marketplace, um, which is pretty exciting. Right, so I walked into that beautiful diversity of a program and at the same time, I started to dabble a little bit in exploring food science, and I enrolled in a product development course through the Department of um, Food Science. And um, uh, as I was in this class, we were often discussing how uh, products often go from idea and inception to a prototype to testing and to eventual release. And as we were discussing the food product development pipeline, I noticed there were a lot of parallels to the plant product development pipeline or the breeding pipeline as well. Um, both have underlying themes of involving multiple players. Uh, we as plant breeders are working with farmers and distributors and processors often. Same thing goes for food product developers. There's also the underlying themes that these are kind of exploratory pipelines where uh, you might n it might just not be a linear uh, line, but you're kind of jumping forward and back throughout the pipeline and kind of receiving iterative, iterative feedback throughout both of these pipelines. But I did notice that in plant breeding pipelines, at least how they were described in text and often depicted, was that they didn't mention market, end users, or, or consumers as often as food product development pipelines would. That's not to say that that discussion didn't happen or it didn't exist. It just wasn't uh, totally apparent to me. Um, and I didn't see their presence as often. And it was interesting because at the same time I was seeing all this diverse in the field, I was taking this product development class, I was also kind of extending my knowledge into and seeing influences that were happening in the broader food system. Um, and a lot of my influence was drawn from some public uh, plant breeding projects, um, such as the Culinary Breeding Network out at Oregon State, the Seed to Kitchen Collaborative at UW-Madison, or the Bread Lab out at Washington State. And these public projects uh, sought to connect players across the food system to develop products for unique markets and unique <coughs> and diverse needs. Um, and exposure and interest in these projects really uh, kind of opened my eyes to other trends, I guess, uh, across the food system. So I've seen trends in, in toward local food through CSAs and farmers markets. Um, I was also exploring methods of participatory plant breeding um, that involved many different players in the development of varieties and ultimately were also influencing how seed companies were evaluating and releasing varieties. And these trends even got further up the chain and so I started noting, noticing changes in dining and in grocery retail and in meal delivery services and my brain became a mess like this. Um, but um, I thought it would be interesting um, to, I noticed how the consumer and had an imperative role in um, how food was sourced, um, developed, and consumed. And I um, thought it'd be interesting to talk about and ask about what a consumer-driven or a consumer-forward approach in our breeding program might look like and whether it might be feasible to implement. Um, now, I'm certainly not the first person to think about uh, consumer forward breeding. Arguably, fruit breeders have been thinking about this for many, many years. Uh, agronomic crops with high value processed products like wheat and barley and potatoes have been thinking about end users for many years. So I'm not the first to think about this. Even plant breeders and brassica have worked on consumer forward traits. We can go back to uh, the late 70s, early 80s when we started to see some diversification in the color of cauliflower appear on market. Um, we can go to the mid 80s, late 80s where Dutch breeders were breeding for lower glucosinolate Brussels sprouts to impart a less bitter taste in Brussels sprout varieties. And even more recently, we can see the release of kaolettes from Tozer seeds um, in about 2012, 2013, which is a cross of Brussels sprouts and kale and essentially introduce a completely different novel <laughs> morphotype to market. So I'm not the first to think about this, um, but um, the, given the recent rise in popularity of different kale types and the fact that I was working in 
a relatively new leafy brassica breeding program, it led me to ask, well, what's holding us back from uh, developing new types of leafy brassicas with different tastes, different appearance, and different novelty? And what I was led to was the fact that we had a void in our breeding program. We didn't have any consumer insight in our breeding program. Um, uh, we didn't have information about potential markets. We didn't have information about consumers in these markets and their motivators or their preferences. So I was missing a lot of information. And consumers are constantly changing. Uh, the way they interact with products constantly change. And these changes necessitate um, using tools that are commonplace in the food industry um, and product development to obtain consumer insights. Um, some of these, there's a lot of overlap in the tools that are used, but some of these tools um, include like marketing and market research. So um, thinking about concept testing, message testing, um, pricing, web page clicks, et cetera, research and development, changing up technologies or processing, sales being revenue or uh, industry reports. And then um, finally, the consumer product testing, which really tries to hit on how consumers are interacting and perceiving products. Um, and I thought, while most of these are way beyond my expertise or comfort zone, I thought that the consumer product testing component might be um, an area where I could explore tools that we as plant breeders could connect with consumers. So some of these tools include sensory testing, um, consumer use studies, focus groups, qualitative assessments, et cetera. And so these were kind of uh, the tools I had in mind of using and as I was thinking about how we apply them, I came up with the big questions. Um, and I uh, thought that I could, using these tools and all the diversity in our breeding program, begin to answer a few things. The first was exploratory in nature. Is there sensory variation in our leafy brassica germplasm. If there's not variation as a breeder for a trait, we don't have any ability to make selections or make improvements or release anything novel. So we have to know that there is variation there. My second question was, plant breeders are not food scientists and they're not sensory analysis analysis. So how do we think about doing sensory, conducting sensory analysis in non-traditional settings um, that plant breeders more commonly operate in. Another big question that I had in my mind was in our breeding program, we have a huge uh, amount of diversity and a large number of lines that we're often working with. So how do we handle these large number of lines in, consumer, uh, in the consumer context? And then finally, how good of a phenotype is consumer liking when we're thinking about making breeding decisions? Can we use consumer liking to make impactful breeding decisions? So these four questions kind of framed my dissertation, and they're going to frame the rest of this talk, um, and uh, hopefully we'll get through them all. Um, but the first I want to talk about uh, was what I jumped into right away when I got here was, all right, is there variation for uh, sensory traits in our program? So knowing this, um, I set up uh, a few objectives um, that I thought would be useful in uh, answering this question. Now, first, just characterize our breeding program for sensory traits and consumer preferences. Uh, the second would be to determine whether there were certain sensory traits that we could strategically deploy or select for in our breeding program as well. Those are pretty clear objectives in my mind. Um, there was only a couple problems. The first was that um, I was extremely intimidated. This was my field that we were working in when I first arrived. And this, if this is what you're told you can work with, you don't really know where to start. Um, so it was overwhelming to me in that sense. The second reason it was overwhelming was because I have no idea how to do consumer product testing. Um, it was a completely new field to me. So I really um, needed to step back and think about who I could partner with to answer some of these questions. Um, nope. Right. So at that point, I got in touch with the Cornell Sensory Center, and I was very fortunate to start forming some collaborations uh, with Robin Dano and Alina Stelic. And Alina's here today, and I'm very glad because these two helped set up a foundation for most of the rest of my research going forward. Um, and in talking with them, they really put my mind at ease because they said, all right, all that diversity that you have in the field and all those numbers that you have, those are actually assets when we're looking 
uh, to deploy new products into the food industry. Um, so let's use them, let's explore them, and then let's use them. So in talking with Alina, we set up kind of a strategic plan to evaluate all these materials. And we approached it from two different perspectives. We used a qualitative product research assessment, and then we also used some quantitative sensory analysis as well. And I'm gonna talk just a little bit about um, about those but between these two processes we really created a holistic picture of the sensory landscape of leafy brassicas so our first study um, was a qualitative uh, sensory analysis where we thought to explore how consumers are interacting with leafy brassicas and explore their needs and wants without much in interference from us as researchers um, and so uh, using a series of Qualitative assessments kind of all combined into one method known as a qualitative uh, multivariate analysis. We were able to um, assess kind of the, cons the consumer values and um, emotions associated with kale purchasing and consumption. So to start off this study, we assembled a group of 14 different consumers who uh, we gave six different leaf types of leafy brassicas and we sent them home with these different leaf types. We said, cook them in your own kitchen, prepare them however you want, but you have to keep some really good notes on what you do. So we made them take journals and photograph and document their experiences with these products. Um, and about two weeks later, we brought them back in for an intense three hour focus group where we dissected all the kale emotions you could imagine. <laughs> um, there's a lot. Um, but uh, in this focus group is this very dynamic discussion between these participants who were well-informed and well-versed in this product set. And we were able to perform some product mapping. Um, we discussed the values associated with purchases and consumption. And then most importantly, we established a foundation for understanding what sensory attributes might be important to differentiating these products um, in a consumer's mind. So there's this qualitative portion to this study. And then the following year, we jumped into the more quantitative sensory analysis side of it, where we sought to pick apart whether those differences between products that we talked about in the focus group and through a qualitative assessment were in fact true differences. Um, so we did a two-part um, study using these quantitative measures, the first of which we trained a descriptive panel to be able to identify and rate the intensity of about 40 different sensory attributes spanning texture and flavor and aroma. Um, and through, those rate, through the identification and rating of those attributes, we're able to differentiate the different leaf types in our program according to different sensory traits. Um, and then the second part of this quantitative portion, uh, we asked about 100 different consumers to come in and try different leaf types from our program and rate how much they liked or disliked these types. And by, oh, by combining these two pieces of information, we were able to understand what consumer clusters prefer what types and what are the underlying sensory traits that are driving some of the liking in these types as well, okay? feel like I'm going a little fast, so I just want to encourage anyone to uh, ask questions if you have any along the way. Um, but yeah, because I'm, I'm still excited about this, even though this wrapped up a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, great. So um, coming out of both this qualitative and this quantitative uh, portions, we can definitively say that there is, in fact, variation in leafy brassica sensory attributes. Um, we found out of those about 40 different attributes that about 20 of them were significantly different among the leaf types, the majority of which were coming from textural attributes. So we're talking about chewy, we're talking about adhesive and fibrousness, things like that, um, that were really differentiated our leaf type, our, our leaf um, genotypes. Uh, this work was recently published in the Journal of Food Science, so I encourage you to look into it more, but we've also, coming out of it, really generated a foundation for any other leafy brassica breeding program, not that there's many, but um, for anyone else interested in evaluating quality in leafy brassicas, to have a lexicon to use and to understand what traits they might first look for if they want to um, start improving these types. Um, there's what degree, Hannah, did participants value the visual qualities? Right. So there's most definitely a difference in, in visual qualities. Um, we did not, however, ask the consumers in that 
study to view whole leaves. So when they got or received a sample, it was already cut up. So the ability to evaluate whole leaf appearance was not so strong. But I have another project later where we do evaluate appearance. So I'll get to that in just a little bit. Yeah, so lots of other things we could take, directions we could take this study. Um, I think I really want to point out that all of this was only performed using one preparation method, and that is raw kale. I mean, you probably haven't eaten a lot of raw kale lately. Uh, maybe you have, well, I guess it's technically raw, but it's got dressing on it. Um, if you've ate the salad in the back. Um, but che uh, checking and validating these, um, this lexicon and this resource with other alternative preparation methods would be very important. And then again, correlating those textural attributes with actual plant traits is going to be imperative if we want to um, breed for them in our program as well. So that kind of wraps up uh, that first question. We have variation, good. Let's go, let's move forward. Let's figure out how we can capitalize on that variation. Um, and I still had three other lingering questions. Um, and one of the biggest ones that I walked away from this first study with was trying to figure out um, how we as plant breeders can conduct sensory analysis. Um, many uh, sensory techniques are difficult uh, with non-processed products and they're not amenable, always, a, and sensory analysis methods aren't always amenable to the environments in which plant breeders work, like the field or conferences, and they can also be expensive. So I had lots of questions about how we can also um, uh, explore sensory analysis in a non-standardized setting, I suppose. Um, and I approached this question from a couple different perspectives, and I certainly wish I had more time to discuss this project, these two projects, but I'm just going to introduce them and let you know I'm thinking about them. <laughs> um, the first was really um, uh, me asking the question, well, what if we brought sensory evaluation to those places in which consumers and food are interacting. I was seeing breeding programs and uh, groups performing sensory tests at trade shows and conferences, things like that. Um, and I was curious how well these environments provide valid and useful sensory information uh, to a breeding program. So in se September 2018, I partnered with Grow NYC and Green Markets to conduct sensory evaluation in three different markets across New York City. And um, I also conducted those same sensory evaluation tests in the Cornell Sensory Center. Um, and this study allowed me to understand how information collected at the farmer's markets might compare to that information collected in a highly controlled environment as well. Um, and it allowed me to assess the feasibility of a breeding program moving out and going into these in situ kind of settings uh, when they want to perform sensory evaluation. Uh, my second uh, project explore thought to address the, the time and the financial constraints of sensory analysis um, in a breeding program. So I employed what's known as a rapid uh, sensory evaluation method called flash profiling um, to quickly describe a set of collards, both in upstate and in western Kenya, two pretty different regions. But um, by using this method, I was able to contrast lexicons and preferences in those two regions without having to train a descriptive panel, which can be costly and time intensive as well. Now again, as I said, I do wish I had more time to talk about these because these were very experiential and they helped me kind of, uh, they were formative and that they helped me contextualize a lot of this research, but um, I realized running down this question could put me into a rabbit hole of trying to identify the perfect sensory method applicable for every breeding program. And that's just not possible. Um, so I had to step back, but I did learn a lot about how we need adaptable methods um, that we can, where we can collect information easily from participants that we more commonly work with as plant breeders. Um, so lots of directions to go there. I am going to skip forward though because I know you're wondering, are we ever going to get to the last three questions? Um, and we are, because these are two really big and important questions in my mind. Um, and good news is, I'm going to try to tackle them both in uh, the same project. Um, and in doing so, I had to really think creatively, because these seemed like two very different questions, but in order to answer them, I needed to combine them. Um, so with a little bit of creativity, I thought about the tools that I could use to answer both of those questions. And to answer how we uh, handle the large number 
of limes and the diversity inherent with our, our breeding programs. I dug deep into the plant breeding toolbox and some of the methods that I had learned in plant breeding classes um, and decided to use what's known as a dialogue mating design. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, on the consumer side, can we use consumer liking to evaluate breeding, uh, to make breeding decisions? I dug deep into the sensory evaluation tools and decided to run, conduct a consumer survey. And it's really through the combination of these two tools that I realized I was able to gauge consumer perception of many different uh, leafy brassica types and determine whether certain parents and hybrids are more liked by consumers as well. Let's pick this apart because it's not making a lot of sense now, I'm sure. But here is that plant breeding tool that we have, the dialel. Now the dialel is the term for a mating design that involves crossing among many different uh, di and diverse parental lines. Um, mating designs are really common to understand the inheritance of complex genetic traits, complex quantitative traits, um, but it's also used to estimate the amount of genetic variance in a population, and it can also be used to estimate whether there are parental effects and whether certain parents in a population um, more greatly affect a phenotype. Um, so it has a lot of utility in the plant breeding world. Um, these are not question marks. These are, should be X's, um, <laughs> as in representing cells, because what this diagram depicts is the actual crossing scheme that I used. So you can see I have eight different inbred parents on the axes here, and these eight different parents come from our breeding program and represent essentially eight different market classes of leafy brassicas. We have a collared type, we have a curly kale, Tuscan kale, Etc. And what I did with these eight inbred parents is cross them in all possible cross combinations. So they're cross all to each other. And in doing so, developed what I'm calling a hybrid progeny set of 28 different hybrids. Make sense? Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so coming out of this, I essentially have 36 diff very different diverse leafy brassica types that I can then put into a consum consumer survey. I ended up creating an online consumer preference survey by imaging all of the 36 leaves from the dialo and um, uploading them to a Qualtrics or a survey, uh, online survey format. Um, now by imaging these, le imaging these leaves, I'm yes only addressing one sensory modality, appearance. There's a lot of other things that are gonna come into play when we're talking about overall liking of a product, but I'm making the concession for this study to just study appearance. Right, so all of these leaves are now in a survey, <laughs> and um, when a participant would click into the survey, they would be given a random subset of seven leaves uh, to look at from that dialogue design. Within each leaf, they would be asked two primary questions. The first is, how much do you like this leaf? On a scale of one to nine, how much do you like or dislike this leaf type? The second question I asked was, how familiar are you with this leaf? Have you seen it before? Does it ring any bells? And that was just a one to five scale. After they viewed the seven leaf types, um, we asked a little bit of questions about demographics and consumption patterns at the end, and then let them go on their way. And now I released this survey through the Cornell Sensory Center, and within a week and a half, I had 567 participants in the study, which is pretty darn cool. Um, because they saw just a subset of that six, those six types, or sorry, those 36 types, um, that means each leaf image was viewed approximately 132 times. And we had some good numbers to run some decent statistics, some statistics on as well coming out of this survey. Right on. So the main hypothesis in combining these two tools is that expected market classes like that iconic curly kale and like uh, collard are going to exhibit a high positive correlation with familiarity. These are the two most common on the marketplace, so we expect them to be the most familiar. But they all, the, uh, the other hypothesis is that these established market classes will also exhibit a high general combining ability within the context of this dialogue. That is, these parents and all of their hybrid progeny on average are going to be rated higher for liking than other parents and progeny in the dialogue. So those are my two kind of hypotheses, hypotheses moving forward. Before I give away the big reveal of what was like the best, I wanna talk about that second question I asked first. Um, 
and that is about familiarity because immediately when we got this data back, we noticed that there was a significant positive correlation between familiarity and liking. Um, so you can just see here as familiarity went up, liking also went up for these different genotypes. Kind of makes sense. We like what we know. Um, also kind of makes sense that the most familiar was the most uh, prevalent market class type, this iconic curly kale. The least familiar was this Tuscan kale type. Um, we can talk about that later. Um, and it was hard for me to really assess what was driving liking. There weren't many uh, demographics that were popping up as uh, significantly affecting familiarity, other than the fact that people who ate more leafy brassicas tended to rate leaf types more familiar. Makes sense, they eat more of them. Right, but um, it's very important to weight, know this, knowing this, important to weight familiarity against liking because otherwise we as plant breeders might be missing opportunities to develop or re release varieties that people are not familiar with, but they might actually like, and with enough exposure might even adopt into their regular routine. So I put together two different models um, that do and do not incorporate familiarity. And um, what you can see here is a graph of those two different models where we do not have familiarity and we do have familiarity. And then a Y equals X line where you can see that the mean change of incorporating familiarity um, affects certain varieties more than others. So, um, we saw a few different rank changes, depending on where they are in relation to this line. But um, in general, we saw trends in that that leaf type that was most familiar and its progeny tended to go down in liking as we accounted for familiarity. And then that leaf type, the purple curly kale, or the purple deep purple kale that no one's really seen before, went up in liking a little bit. I think you get that there. So there were some rank changes, but in general, even after we accounted for familiarity, it didn't necessarily affect the ends of our distribution for liking. That is, those that were most liked stayed the most liked, and those that were the least liked stayed the least liked. So with that, I present the most liked and least liked <laughs> types. So on the top, we have our top five most liked leaves from this study. On the bottom, we have the least liked. And just visually looking at this, you can start to see that there's some trends. Up at the top, we have uh, collared types and those, that curly green kale type kind of shining through. Um, and then on the bottom, we actually have uh, the two different parental types, the Tuscan kale and a jagged leaf broccoli, and then some of their progeny in the least light. So just looking visually at these leaves, you can kind of see and think that, oh, there's probably some parental effect to liking going on here. Um, we can also look at this from a couple of other angles by overlaying liking onto that original dialogue diagram. So here, um, those squares and those leaves with darker orange behind them were more liked um, than those with lighter orange behind them. And so you can start to see some banding patterns along the parental, uh, along certain parental types that are, are more liked or that are less liked. Another way to visualize it is to actually use some um, GBS markers on this dial -L set and run a structure analysis where um, the genotypes are colored according to parental repre representation, and then they're ordered according to overall liking. So those that are most liked are up at the top, and those that are least liked are down at the bottom. And you can kind of see in this graph, too, that those collared parents appear up at the top, and those from the Tuscan and the jagged leaf parents appear at the bottom. All right, so we visually assess this whole parental effect thing, um, but we want to see some numbers. So dug into the quantitative genetics portion of my limited background um, and uh, decided to assess these parental effects using heritability. And now heritability is um, a measure that seeks to describe the overall variance, um, percentage of a, a variance of a phenotype that's due just to the genetic effects. So you exclude environmental, you exclude the participant effect. Um, and so how much of the variance that we see in overall liking is just due to genetics? And this descriptor can be viewed in a couple different ways. Um, the first is known as broad sense, which accounts for all sorts of, all of the genetic effects. Um, and um, in our case, in the context of the study, this broad sense measure is essentially our ability to find crosses that are more, that tend to be more liked than others. It's very high, 
we have 36 different genotypes, so our ability to find one that might be more liked is, is relatively high. The other measure of heritability accounts for just the parental effect or just the additive genetic variance in trying to figure out how much of it, how much of our phenotype overall liking um, is a result of additive variance. Um, and so within our study, this narrow sense heritability is really our ability to select a parent, one of those eight parents in the dialel, that tend to produce progeny that are more liked. Does that make sense? We're following that? Okay, so um, heritability is a can of worms in <laughs> a lot of plant breeding discussions, and I don't want to um, get too far into it, but to, if there's any plant breeders in the room who are gawking at these numbers, these are very high for heritability numbers. But we have to contextualize them in this, the context of this study. We had each leaf viewed 113 times. Essentially, that's like 113 replications of each leaf. So these heritability calculations, just by the nature of the equation, are bound to be high. But if we think about our ability to uh, find crosses that one participant tends to like more than others, but so using just a sample size of n, those heritability estimates go down dramatically. Um, and I guess at this point, I really like to thank Nick Santantonio for helping me kind of think through some of these descriptions and um, how, to, how to convey the message, message here. Um, but ultimately, what I want you to take away is that our ability uh, to use genetics in consumer liking is small, but it's not zero. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, with that, I want to also address the but why. <laughs> why are we seeing these genetic effects? There's got to be some underlying reason or underlying plant trait that's driving these. So to address this question, I started uh, looking at just what those participants who took the survey might have seen. So the images. Um, I went back to each image and I extracted the percent of each image that was occupied by a leaf and uh, termed that the image's visual volume. And we can see here that as visual volume increased, liking also increased. So people like bigger things, I guess. Um, not quite sure, but it's certainly something to keep in mind in the development of future surveys that maybe more than one photograph of leaf types might be beneficial there. Other thing I did with these images was extract the most prominent color from each image. So I extracted the four most prominent colors from each genotype here, and I organized them just like that structure plot from most liked to least liked. And I was really <laughs> hoping to see some really prominent color trends here. And I guess if you blur your eyes, you can kind of see that more green is at the top and there's a little blue green at the bottom. Um, but in general, just looking at this, I can't make a lot of generalizations about color driving liking, in, at least in this study. So there's lots of other traits that we've also looked at in this dialogue, and I don't have time to talk about it, but we phenotyped um, these traits in the field last summer as well. So I have lots of information on morphological attributes like the degree of blistering and leaf curl, um, lamina width, petiole width, et cetera. Um, and, and through partnership with Carl Sams at University of Tennessee, we also have some information on taste and nutrition um, coming down the, right, uh, down the road. So uh, we have glucosinolate data, and we'll have carotenoid and anthocyanin data as well. And using all of these uh, diverse plant traits, we can overlay consumer liking and see if we see some trends there. Um, but that is in the works, down the road, and I'm, even after I get through this, I'm still not sure I'm gonna have all, all the answers uh, as to why exactly we're seeing these genetic effects, but um, we're trying. <laughs> so coming out of this project, there are uh, many directions that I would improve and uh, think about revising. Um, namely, I guess I would think about streamlining this dialogue. I use very diverse parents in this uh, mating design, and as such, there's a lot of confounding factors. So it's difficult to parse apart whether color or whether the leaf curl is affecting overall liking more. So thinking about using something that's a little bit more streamlined, like let's, these Tuscan kale lines that are coming down the pipeline in our program that Griff is holding, where they don't have different leaf shapes. Um, and they don't have different sizes. They're only differentiated for color. Might be something um, to probe in the future. And then on the consumer side, I realized that we only sent it out to consumers in New York. And so uh, leafy brassicas are consumed worldwide. Um, they're not consumed at all in some places, I guess. Um, but it'd be interesting to 
understand liking across a geographical range. I'm not going to get too far into the rest, but there's just a lot of directions that we could take, uh, take, this, take this study. But important insights that we walk away with from this large study is that uh, parental selection remains important as we breed new varieties. I think any plant breeder would probably tell you that, um, but I guess I've confirmed it in leafy brassicas. Um, consumer liking as a phenotype has some genetic component, according to this study, um, but we require a large number of participants in order to be able to see that signal. Um, and further, we need to continue to think about creative approaches to answer these last two questions that I had. How do we deal with a large number of lines and how um, do we gauge consumer liking? Um, and how do we integrate different sensory modalities besides just appearance? So um, those creative approaches, uh, not that I've run dry of creativity, um, but require multidisciplinary partners. And so a tenant of our program has really been to reach out to diverse uh, groups, whether they're in industry or the, private, or the public sector as well. Um, because these groups can kind of push you in what you think trait priorities should be um, and open up your, your open up opportunities to new markets. So just next week, we're actually meeting with DIG to discuss breeding for softer stems for their restaurant use. And at the same visit, we're going to Bowery Farms to discuss what a breeding program for vertical agriculture might look like. And so um, trait priorities exist far beyond just consumer liking. Um, and it's important to talk across the food system to understand what other trait priorities should exist. Um, and this is not to overwhelm you at all, but um, these are just graphs of the people I've worked with along the way. I wish I had um, other images of the actual people, but these are, this is the demographics of uh, individuals who participated in three out of my four studies. And I really do think that there's value in some of this work because the minute we involve consumers and end users in the evaluation of some of our breeding materials, uh, we also engage in outreach and education. Um, so in total, after filtering, uh, 1,848 people contributed to my dissertation directly, which is pretty darn cool. I feel like a plant breeder being like, I worked with 30 million SNPs. Well, I worked with 1,848 people. And that's pretty cool. Pretty cool to me. Um, now, are all 1,848 people going to adopt our new kale varieties? Probably not. Um, but uh, we've at least captured their voice in evaluating that. And finally, I uh, just want to hint at some other things that are coming out of our product pipeline. Um, we, we are trying to cater to those 1,848 people through many different ways. We're continuing to breed for the market standards, the iconic curly kale. So on the left here, you see some trials with hymoing seeds uh, where we're uh, selecting for a tighter curl and a little bit longer leaf type for those markets. Um, in the middle here, you see uh, an incremental product development to essentially make kale accessible. So this Tuscan kale type was the least liked in our program. But what happens when we start to change the color? Does that change the perception and does that make it uh, more approachable by people who do not traditional, traditionally consume kale? Um, we'll see, but it's kind of like thinking about you wouldn't jump into eating a flaming hot dill pickle potato chip before you try a regular potato chip first. So um, let's, let's see how we can ease them into the, the flaming hot Tuscan kale. Um, <laughs> right, and then last, I wanna say we're also hedging our bets with novelty as well. Um, we are in the final stages of testing uh, this variety, which is slotted to be called Daydreamer uh, through Johnny's Seeds, but it really combines some of those main themes I saw in this last survey where uh, we have that little bit of familiar leaf curl, we have a bright green color, and then we have this unfamiliar but liked uh, red midrib. So we'll see how this does. Um, it's going to be exciting over the next few years to see some of these come to marketplace because we're getting very close with them um, and to see what happens when uh, <laughs> they become subject to the food system and all of its uh, ins and outs and critiques. So um, I'm very excited and happy to be part of, of the development of some of these types. Uh, with that, I want to wrap up with just so many thank yous. Um, I feel very fortunate to have a committee that is supportive and understanding, um, Griff and Steve and Olga. 
Um, I'm very appreciative. My work at the Sensory Center, as I said, established my foundation for a lot of this work. So thank you, Alina. Thank you, Robin. Um, and then all of the Griffith Lab members, they've been such a support and such a humorous group to work with. So I'm glad to have them on my side. And then brain busters along the way, Zach and Nick and Lynn and Carl and Charles. Um, super glad to have you all around. And then all the folks who helped with the production side, whether it's in the greenhouse or the field, I'm very, very grateful to that. And then finally, my family and friends who are still with me in my <laughs> 37th year of grad school. No, I'm not 37, so I don't know how many years I've been in school anymore. Great. Um, yeah, with that, I would love to talk and take questions and see what you have to say. Thank you. Two questions. Uh, so with the dislike of the Tuscan kale, do you think it might be related to the fact that the leaves are so much smaller and that the consumer doesn't think they're getting value if they're buying the same amount? And then second, you showed the graph of the different glucosinolates. Is there any correlation between glu glucosinolates and visual? So I can see branthocyanins and carotenoids, but I would think it'd be hard to guess how bitter it is based on how it looks. Totally. So going to your first question, for those who didn't hear, uh, Dan was asking about uh, whether the perceived value of Tuscan kale was less because it didn't occupy as much, it wasn't as large, had thinner leaves. And that's why I really calculated the visual volume because that was something I saw. I was like, okay, yeah, I use three leaves in each image, but the Tuscan kale just doesn't occupy as much space. So are people thinking they're not getting uh, the same yield or they're not getting the same value? And that would require much deeper questions to answer, but it's certainly something that I'm aware of and why I think we should take multiple images of each leaf from different angles um, to see if it's a true artifact of the leaf or if it's a uh, artifact of the image. Yeah, and then the second question, was with regard to whether uh, there's a correlation between appearance and glucosinolates. And that's a very hard draw. Yeah, totally. Glucosinolates are taste imparting compounds that you probably don't see um, right off the bat. Um, and so I don't know, but I would love in future surveys to actually probe, probe nutritional, perceived nutritional co um, content. Like how, much, how nutritious do you think this leaf is? because that might be affecting overall liking um, as well. But just looking at this PCA that I put together of glucosinolates over, and the genotypes, it's interesting to note that most of those liked genotypes are actually highest in glucosinolates as well. And then the Tuscan types are on the opposite side. Um, so can we see nutrition? Probably not, but there's other questions we can ask for sure. Yeah. Geneva, uh, I know you're there, hopefully. <laughs> uh, do you have any questions? I, I have a question. Can you oh. hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, this is great. Great seminar. My, my question is, what do you think is the right balance between directly incorporating consumer feedback into the breeding process in terms of actually making selections versus maybe the more traditional approach where the breeder uh, you know has in his or her mind what he or she thinks the market demands and just individually making selections uh, thinking about what consumers eventually want but being really driven by one person's ideas right right those are those are two kind of polar opposites it's uh, Greg Greg right uh, I was asking about uh, whether we use a model that is completely focus on using consumer liking as where the market goes and where our selection goes or uh, relying on the breeder to uh, determine where the market goes. And I guess um, this, is, this is opinion. Um, I, I view that the idea that one person's opinion is right is wrong. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, I, it, 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 there's no way that a single person can capture information across a food system and be able to synthesize all of it. And so a large driver for me in this research was that at least we're talking to other people and integrating their, their feedback. And you can choose whether to incorporate that into your breeding decision through uh, something like a weighted selection uh, where you incorporate consumer liking, but to a small degree in your overall uh, selection scheme. Um, so there's, yeah, the balance between those is really hard and I'm not sure I've 
I've answered your question exactly because I don't have it figured out because again, it depends on breeding program and, and a breeder's drive to, to connect and understand players across the food system. So uh, I hope that helps. Okay, Zach. Wonderful talk. Um, did you partition any of your survey results data and see different patterns in consumer preference in and of themselves? For example, are some consumers more novelty seeking and some are more traditional? And then the second part of the question is what are those two things you're holding and why? Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the first question Zach asked was uh, with regard to whether I par partitioned out um, kind of uh, the demographics of consumers and whether there were underlying behavioral patterns to the consumers in the study that might be driving their familiarity or their liking. And um, I did not ask what is a very important question, and um, that is, are, do you have variety seeking behavior? Because uh, there are some people who know what they know and that's all they want, and that is totally fine. But there are also other people who very much seek out new ideas, new things, new products, and want to try the newest and latest. And those are two different, very, two very different consumer groups. And so it's important to ask these variety seeking behavior questions in future surveys. I definitely would love to. I'd also love to pick apart the demographics a bit further because it'd be interesting to contrast those people in that large survey who consumed leafy brassicas consistently and reported eating kale uh, most commonly to those people who don't eat leafy brassicas as much and eat kale um, and, and eat kale when when they do eat leafy brassicas eat kale because those are also very different questions. Yeah, uh, and this is my happiest moment in Ithaca next to getting married, I guess. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I am. Uh, the 2016 International Rutabaga Curling Champion, and um, so uh, this is me holding the winning Rutabaga and my wooden medal for winning that curling championship. And I'm getting time, but I'd love to talk to you after. Or do we have one more question? Sure. Okay, sorry, one more question, yeah. Oh, it's not really a question so much as a comment to add on. Because you're talking about doing nutritional value as perceived nutritional value as a question. Sure. But I wonder too if um, how it, people perceive the ease of preparation of a leaf, because some that really thin leaf could look that it's just really tough to prepare and cut the stem off of or something. So, so maybe that would kind of ease people to say, I don't really like want to deal with that type of thing. Right, right, right. Like, would would you envision incorporating this into part of your routine, or do you view it as uh, too much of a barrier to to work with in the kitchen? Is a super great question. Absolutely, and definitely something we can do. And this is always what we struggle with when we're talking about consumer research because you want to ask more. <laughs> so many questions, but they don't, they, don't, they don't want to spend that much time. You have about five, seven minutes maximum to capture consumer information. Um, and so you have to really be poignant in what questions you're asking. But yeah, I have many more. <laughs> so thank you for coming today. Uh, Y'all take care, grab some salad. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.